about two months or a month and a half before Gregory died, I took a walk with him at Esalen, and we were climbing up the stairs up the side of the cliff there, and it was so beautiful. And you know how it is in this part of California, down through the Big Sur coast. It's like the ecology is not an abstraction. It's actually the integration of all things of nature is really like a person right there in front of you. And uh, Gregory was, he was walking very slowly, enjoying the walk, but stopping to cough and having kind of a hard time and he spit up blood a couple of times and when he did this he looked at me and he said I'm an old dinosaur and I'm going to die soon but you're a young dinosaur and God help you <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, there were so many ways that this could be taken, uh, including uh, his talk about dinosaurs as all these um, uh, lumbering all over the place creatures that didn't quite fit in all the way back to Pythagoras. Uh, but he was also, it was clear that part of it, he was talking about uh, his predictions about uh, the relationship between human and themes and global ecology. Uh, and um, what I might have to live through as a young man. Uh, so now uh, it's 32 years later and I'm getting to be kind of old myself. And I have already been in the position of apologizing to my sons uh, and apologizing to other young people for the fucked up situation that we are leaving them in. And in a sense, we, I was born in 1950, and you know, many, of, I mean, many of us are the same age here, more or less. And uh, you know, we were the generation, the post-war, the hippie, the women's revolution, the revolution of many kinds. We were the generation that was so well educated uh, and um, had begun to be steeped in environmental values and in social justice values and in anti-war values. And surely, by the time we got to be this age, things would be better. And, of course, we see what they are. So that's kind of a, <laughs> a lesson of, about self-regard and hubris, among other things. My son, Jack, has, uh, uh, he's 19, he said to me about two years ago, uh, we were having breakfast and he, he looks up at me and he says, you know, Dad, um, there's a good chance that I'm gonna die in a Malthusian event. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, in a sense, you know, part of our hope for the future is that now we have a lot of young people who are really kind of seeing this stuff. Uh, and are uh, perhaps in the way that um, Lois described earlier, um, going to figure out ways to live a little bit more simply uh, and maybe even maybe a little bit more nomadically in some other slightly different lifestyles that might be a little better and that might be nice. And they might have a bigger idea of integration of global patterns and of being able to be in touch with people of like mind, you know, even though people in this room are pretty much of like mind. I mean, a couple times in the week, somebody, uh, Ralph and somebody earlier in the weeks talked about preaching to the choir, and that's always an issue in this kind of group. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the big issue that was hinted at before is how to go beyond the choir and how to get incrementally more consciousness, bigger consciousness of what's going on and why it's going on and what are the sane ways to think, feel, and be. 
So, what happened to me, I was Gregory's student in the early 70s and and I was kind of on track to become an academic and uh, somehow I ended up as a uh, professional improviser, uh, as an improvisational musician and playing with improvisation across all fields. Uh, and it was really with his encouragement. And uh, I used to go down when I was in my 20s, I would go down and see Gregory and say, oh, I've just discovered this about the patterning of sound. And what do you think of that? And we would sort of, what do you think about synesthesia and intermedia art forms? And we would talk about these. And there was a sense of a kind of a gap that every one of us has come to in these talks because we are speaking denotative language and even if we speak denotative language really well it's still in the realm of nouns and breaking the world apart into things and Gregory Gregory said that we need to be able to speak a language of relationship, a pattern language, a language that connects, you know, all of his metaphors, the metaphor that Jerry Brown alluded to at the beginning of the week of, I'm chopping the tree down, I'm playing this instrument with the bow, where does my arm, you know, when you teach an instrument like this, uh, you learn to ask that question of where does my arm end and the bow begin? And the answer is, it's in the whole system. So, to some degree, music, and I'm saying music because that's what I do, but it can apply to many pattern languages. Is a language of relationships. So back to that other old dinosaur, Pythagoras, who figured out that all musical tones, all musical rhythms are relationships, they're ratios, they are patterns that connect. And it's a kind of language that we have known how to talk all the way back through evolution. Uh, uh, people are thinking now about uh, something called musilanguage which was the uh, common ancestor of both music and language in human beings, and of course goes way back through animal communication. So when we... When we play with toys like this, we are tapping in for that period of time to this language of relationship and pattern and circular communication. between what we can do with this language, which can be beautiful and can also carry analog messages far beyond the denotative, and what we can do with this language lies uh, what Gregory called grace. He talked about how in the paper style grace and information in primitive art, how in a sense the the mythical angels, that is, those beings, uh, the, the, those imaginary beings that represent total integration with the system, with the biggest of possible systems, and the animals uh, who are, um, in a sense, free as far as we can tell in our limited understanding of them uh, to interact in the moment and as systems and as whole systems in a cross-sensory way in ways that we can barely get 
not that they don't also overgraze themselves into extinction, uh, that human beings have kind of stepped to the side of that wholeness with our denotative languages, with our nouns and our names and the things that we can construct, and that he saw art as being a path back in to integration. It is possible that doing this in the context of a conference where we're talking about Malthusian events and mass extinctions is kind of fiddling while Rome burns. But it is also possible that doing this in that context is the practice, is the play with the kind of thinking that we need to learn to do. And of course the problem is if you go back, you know, if you tried to take notes on what I'm saying here, which would be pretty difficult, you would uh, you would try to translate it back into denotative language. And you can go to school and in the school they'll ask you questions like what is a poem, what does this poem mean? Okay, so here's poetry, which is another language that Gregory loved which stood to the side of the blah, 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 blah that we usually do. And yet, um, we get teachers asking, what does a poem mean? Or what does a piece of music mean? Or what does a painting mean? And people have can check off uh, quiz questions about the, art, the work of art. And, to exist in that realm of play. is very interesting. And to exist in the realm of improvisational play is particularly interesting and a very interesting step in how do we find the language that will enable us to survive in a better way and to have a planet that is something that our children can live on. I mean, we'll all have a planet, of course, but can we live on it? And one of the things about improvisation is that you are in the moment, and in the moment means I am in the slightly overheated room uh, I am hearing the sound that's coming back from the walls of this wonderful Julia Morgan structure and responding to it. I have some awareness of who you all are, and that all feeds into what I may be doing. And if I'm improvising with partners, it's an act of full, real time, all the time, listening and support, and improvisation becomes, improvisation among partners becomes, as it were, a kind of um, exercise in radical democracy. Because you have people co-creating something that's only in this room, only in this time, only among us, but it comes only from us listening to each other and paying absolute attention to each other with all our senses, including the senses that we don't even know about yet, that enable us to do something simultaneous, that's structured, that's coherent, that's interesting, that may have a beginning, middle, and end, or maybe all middle, depending on how it's constructed. Um, but it's a, it's a uh, exercise in a kind of radically interesting and whole world. And if we can play in that way and bring even a portion of that play out into our lives and the way we relate to other people, something interesting could happen. Now, if you want to try this at home, a couple of years ago, I was finished with a roll of paper towels, and I discovered that it's something that you can hit your priceless instrument with, and you're not going to hurt it, but it's a resonating tube with its own standing waves and its own frequencies. 
and it uh, revised the musical instrument as toy. So if you try this at home, do not use brawny paper towels. <laughs> Why? Why? Because they are manufactured by the Koch brothers. <laughs> <laughs> some of these nonverbal languages. Uh, but to be able to do this, as we all can do in daily life, in every conversation, 
Uh, every one of us has conversations all day, every day, which are improvised, which are our immediate relationships with other people. And it's possible for us to be stewards of those relationships, to make those relationships more rich, more interesting, more ethical. You know, I loved uh, when Peter Harris Jones was talking about the bees the other day. Uh, I mean, underneath all of this, I mean, there's been this uh, kind of uh, uh, waving undercurrent throughout this, this entire conference uh, between the poles of ethical and moral behavior in a world where there's a lot of horrible, horrible behavior going on and uh, the need to understand it and is taking action. I mean, Gregory was waving back and forth on this throughout his life. Uh, and uh, it, it's important in some ways to take action, in other ways to step back from action and realize that your attempts to make things better often make things worse. And do you really know what you're doing? And is your systemic thinking really systemic enough? And, and all of these questions. Uh, but uh, as in the case of a vibrating string, you know, these are, we, we often, in language, we talk about poles, you know, is or isn't, and yes and no, and all of the wonderful digital relationships that we attain through language, when actually, uh, uh, and this is again, uh, you may remember Gregory's thing in Mind and Nature about the electric buzzer, that uh, you can think of, of a digital situation, poles on and off, should I take action, should I not do action, to be or not to be, <laughs> all of this uh, as a pair of opposites when in fact uh, in, in the feedback loop of the electric buzzer it's constantly vibrating and to find the right frequency of vibration and the right pitch of that vibration is a uh, lifelong task for each of us. And as I am getting older and older, <laughs> I am seeing more and more how much I need to learn about those pitches and about how we navigate our way through each individual relationship and our bigger and bigger and bigger relationships all the way up to that one. <laughs>